morning. My name is Spencer Compton. I'm the, most of you know me, but for those of you that don't, I'm the senior development editor here for the, for the journal. And I just want to be the first to welcome you. Thanks for making it out through the rain. I know it was kind of a gross morning to come, <laughs> but we're glad you're here. Uh, we're going to start things off this morning with opening remarks. So uh, Professor Hatcher, who is the professor of law and the co-director of our technology and entertainment law program, better known to some of you as TELP, is going to give um, a couple of remarks. Come on in. Come on in. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Spencer. It's, uh, let me be the second to welcome you here. Uh, first, let me just say Spencer and her team have done an amazing job of organizing conferences. For those of you who've done it, you know it's always stressful until everyone's on the plane and home. So, and I, for, not, for fear of not mentioning everybody, let me just say the whole team of wonderful people. Uh, and let me just, uh, it's the 12th year for the journal started by students. It's uh, gained in uh, student enthusiasm every year. I decided to show you, here's the first year. It came out as a large journal. The idea was to interact with the entertainment community after a while, we found out people in the entertainment community are too busy to actually write articles, so the format switched. But uh, this is last year. It's very fat. This was a symposium issue. The journals put on some very wonderful symposiums, and I have no doubt this will be one of them as well. And so that's all I have to say other than, uh, once again, welcome. And let me introduce Chris Guthrie, our wonderful new dean, who's leading us in great new directions as a law school. what happens when you follow Steve. <laughs> um, as Steve said, my name is Chris Guthrie. I'm both a professor of law and the dean at the law school. And on behalf of the school as a whole, it's my pleasure to welcome you as well. Um, this year's symposium is sponsored by two entities, each of which have been mentioned, but I'd like to say a word about each as well. The first sponsor uh, is the Law School's Technology and Entertainment Law Program, or TELP. Uh, the two leaders of which are participating in today's proceedings. Uh, the second sponsor, as you know, is the Law School's Journal of Entertainment and Technology Law, which we refer to as Jet Law. I'd like to uh, say a special thanks and to offer kudos to the Jet Law students for organizing this uh, truly outstanding symposium. Now, you might wonder how I can legitimately claim that this is an outstanding symposium before the proceedings have even begun. And simply stated, the reason I can say that this is an outstanding symposium already uh, is because of you, our participants. Um, the Jet Law editors have assembled a truly impressive group of scholars. Uh, consider, if you will, uh, the following data about you. Um, by my rough count, uh, you have collectively published nearly 190 law review articles in all the top IP journals, including this one, as well as top general interest law reviews all around the country, including at Yale, Vanderbilt, Virginia, Penn, Michigan, Texas, and so forth. You've been cited roughly 3,600 times collectively. Um, if you do a little math and you draw a few inferences, you fairly quickly conclude that that means each of your articles on average has been cited about 20 times, which is a very high citation rate. And finally, you've had your works in progress downloaded nearly 20,000 times on SSRN. So in short, I can claim that this is an outstanding conference because of our participants. And just as the quality of any symposium, including this one, uh, is a product of those participating, the quality of a law school depends upon the quality of its members. And as a longtime faculty member here at Vanderbilt, and as the relatively new dean of the school, I'm enormously proud of the people who make up our law school. So if you'll forgive me just a little bit of bragging, we have a highly productive and engaging faculty that cares deeply about both scholarship and teaching. We have very bright, well-rounded, and socially adept students, as I'm sure you'll see today. And we have a highly competent and very caring staff. Collectively, this means that we have a culture at our law school that's characterized on the one hand by academic rigor, and on the other hand, by a real feeling of community and even friendship for one another. Um, while you're here, I hope you get a sense of the wonderful community we have at the law school. I'm sure that our community is going to benefit tremendously by having you here. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here for a few moments. Have a great symposium. Have a wonderful day here at Vanderbilt. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Dean Guthrie. Um, we're going to go ahead and invite our first panel up now. Um, so if Professors Cotter, Lunny, and Gervais want to come take a seat. Okay, well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first panel. This panel is called Treading the Line, Fair and Derivative Uses, and we want to explore the distinction between um, the derivative use right and the fair use defense or privilege in copyright. Um, now, as most of you know, the dominant issue in fair use cases today is whether the alleged infringement is transformative, that is, whether it transforms the underlying work. But at the same time, we all know that the copyright owner's right to prepare derivative works has long been protected. And in fact, the Copyright Act itself defines this class of protected works as those that are, quote, recast, transformed, or adapted from the original. So it, it's really this underlying con uh, potential conflict that we hope will be at both the heart of our discussion today and will be tackled head on by our first panel. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our three panelists um, this morning. The first will be Professor Thomas Cotter from the University of Minnesota School of Law. Professor Cotter graduated magna cum laude from the University of Wisconsin Law School, where he was also senior articles editor of the Wisconsin Law Review. He then clerked for Judge Pierce on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And he practiced law in New York at Cravath, Swain and Moore, and then later in Chicago at Jenner and Block, before entering academia first at the University of Florida College of Law, and now at University of Minnesota. Now our second panelist is Professor Glenn Lunny. Um, Professor Lunny received his JD from Stanford, where he was articles editor of the Stanford Law Review. He then clerked for Judge, Judge Wisdom on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals before joining the faculty at Tulane Law School in 1991. Now, while at Tulane, Professor Lunny has received numerous awards in recognition of his scholarship in the IP field, while simultaneously earning his PhD in economics. Now, our final panelist is one of my favorite teachers, Professor Daniel Gervais. Now, hopefully some of yours as well, he received his law degree from McGill and practiced law for a number of years in Montreal. He then spent 10 years researching issues of international intellectual property law in a number of important areas, including at the World Trade Organization in the early 90s during the TRIPS negotiations, and then also at the World Intellectual Property Organization, various collective management organizations before entering academia. Now, since that time, Professor Gervais has lectured in law throughout the world, including most recently as the acting dean of the common law section at the University of Ottawa. And he joined Vanderbilt in 2008, where he is now the co-director of our technology and entertainment law program with Professor Hutcher. So I'd like to invite Professor Cotter up first. And if you guys will join me in welcoming our panel. All right, thanks. So the title of my paper is Transformative Use and Cognizable Harm. There we go. All right, um, so for purposes of uh, today's presentation, I think I can skip over some of the introductory portions and, and basically just cut to the chase. Um, transformative use, as already been stated, stated has become a dominant consideration in many fair use cases following on Campbell versus Acuff Rose. And the thesis I present in the paper is that transformative use, unfortunately, often is more of a conclusion, a catchword, if you will, as opposed to an analytical tool for determining whether fair use should apply or not. I argue in the paper that uh, an undue emphasis on transformative use uh, sometimes tends to obscure the underlying policy issues and leads to courts tying themselves up in unnecessary doctrinal knots. 
Uh, and my view is that transformative use should continue to play a role in the fair use analysis, but that it should be subsidiary to the overarching question of whether the user's conduct causes cognizable harm to the copyright owner. So let me begin by highlighting a couple of problems as I see them with the transformative use doctrine. Uh, one is that the transformativeness as a criterion of fair use uh, tends to be under-inclusive. And a number of people have highlighted this problem, including Professor Tushnet, who's speaking later in the day. Um, so, so I won't dwell too much on that particular issue. But the other issue that I will highlight a little bit is that efforts to define transformative use uh, often have proven to be elusive. And in the paper, I go through four different possible ways of defining transformative use for purposes of the fair use analysis. Uh, one would be to define transformative use functionally as any use that is likely to generate more social benefits than social costs. In some ways, that might seem to be an attractive criterion. It would be consistent with one of the rationales for fair use. But the problem, as I see it, is that uh, stated in this fashion, it's really an unworkable standard. We need some more specific criteria or factors um, to try to use this concept in any manageable and predictable way. So I reject that possibility, number one. Uh, the second possibility would be to define transformative use as any use that would result in the creation of a derivative work. So again, following up on what's already been said, Section 101 of the Copyright Act defines a derivative work as, among other things, a work that transforms some underlying work. So one possibility is that the word transformative or transform in section 101 and transformative use in the context of the fair use doctrine mean approximately the same thing. Uh, but the, there's an obvious problem with that. The problem is that if we adopt that definition of transformative use in the fair use context, that that would tend to nullify Section 1062 of the Copyright Act, which uh, confers upon the copyright owner the exclusive right to prepare derivative works. So I reject that possible interpretation as well. Third possibility would, de would be to go uh, exactly in the opposite direction and to define transformative use in the fair use context and transform in the derivative works context in such a way that the two types of transformations are mutually exclusive. Um, and that might seem to be an attractive way of dealing with this dilemma. Um, we see this approach uh, suggested in at least a couple of cases. One is uh, Thai versus Publications International. Uh, one of several uh, opinions authored by Judge Posner uh, dealing with uh, copyright and trademark issues relating to Beanie Babies. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Judge Posner suggests that uh, fair uses, including things such as book reviews or collector's guides, which was the type of work at issue in Thai Inc., uh, those works are complementary to the original work and the derivative works are not. So that could, at least in theory, be a criterion for distinguishing transformative fair uses from transformative infringing uses. Uh, but I think there's a problem with that. I think that uh, we can come up with a list of rather commonplace derivative works that probably are complementary to the original, or at least complementary for some users, if not all. And at the same time, some uses that traditionally have been viewed as fair uses, I think, are not really complementary to the original. So I don't think that Judge Posner's criterion really works as um, a, a, a test for defining this distinction. Uh, we also see this um, attempt to define transformative fair use and transformative infringing uses in a mutually exclusive fashion. We see this also come up in the Harry Potter case, Warner Brothers Entertainment versus RDR Books, where Judge Patterson proposes that derivative works transform the original into another medium, mode, language, or revised version while representing the original, whereas a transformative fair use transforms the purpose of the original. So difference between the one and the other on that basis. Uh, so based on that analysis, Judge Patterson concluded that the, uh, the lexicon, this unauthorized Harry Potter encyclopedia, uh, was not a derivative work 
but it did violate the author's, it violated J.K. Rowling's uh, exclusive right to reproduce expression from the underlying works, the Harry Potter novels. And although it transformed the purpose of the Harry Potter books to some extent, uh, the judge said it did not consistently transform the purpose and therefore did not qualify as a fair use. Um, again, maybe the right result, maybe not, but I think the problem with the uh, framework proposed by Judge Patterson is that it too doesn't really work or it presupposes some other underlying assumptions. Uh, in, in particular, whether a use represents the original or whether it transforms the purpose of the original. I think really depends on how broadly or how narrowly we define those terms. Uh, what does it mean to say that a work represents another? That it substitutes for it, that it symbolizes it, that it stands in for it, that it calls it to mind? It's not altogether clear what that means at the same time. Uh, does it transform the purpose? really depends on at what level of generality we define the purpose. Is the purpose of the unauthorized use consumption or is it something more narrow? Is it entertainment? Is it education? How do we define the purpose? So unless and until we answer those questions, I don't think that this criterion necessarily distinguishes transformative fair uses from transformative infringing uses either. A fourth possibility would be to say, all right, well, maybe none of these categories are airtight. They don't necessarily uh, provide clear guidance as to how to decide individual cases. But at least as an empirical matter, in some sort of rough and ready way, courts are distinguishing between transformations of content on the one hand and transformations of purpose, however defined at uh, the other. And so uh, Professor Tony Reese, uh, in a paper in the Columbia Journal of Law and the Arts, goes through all of the cases since Campbell versus Acuff Rose through 2007 and, and finds this pattern emerging that transformative uh, content is, unlikely, is less likely to be fair use, but transformation of purpose is more likely to be fair use. And so we see that sort of analysis arguably brought to bear. Uh, in the two cases from the Ninth Circuit dealing with thumbnail images, Kelly versus Arebasoft and Perfect 10, uh, both of which concluded that the transformation of content was pretty minimal, but the transformation of pur the purpose of making digital uh, thumbnails uh, was a uh, different purpose uh, from the purpose served by the original images. So maybe this distinction does work, at least in some fairly broad class of cases. But, but again, not all. So we can find cases in which um, courts uh, don't really seem to follow this particular pattern. I mentioned in the paper one uh, fairly recent case from the United States Court of Federal Claims, Gaylord versus United States, which involves an unauthorized reproduction of a sculptural work uh, on a postage stamp. So it's a suit against the United States government. Um, and in that case, arguably, there's a transformation of content, but really hard to see exactly what the transformation of purpose is. The purpose of both the original and the uh, unauthorized use is, I think, aesthetics. Uh, nevertheless, in that case, the court found that the use was a fair use. So again, the application of these criteria, I think, still leads to a fair amount of unpredictability. The thesis that I address in the paper is that uh, really the, the focus of the fair use analysis ought to be something else, that we ought to be focusing instead on whether the unauthorized use um, threatens the copyright owner with what I refer to as cognizable harm. And this is a theme that we are seeing uh, beginning to emerge uh, in the scholarship of a number of uh, copyright uh, professors, including uh, Professor Balganash, Professor Bohannon, who's here today, and several others. Uh, the overarching question, that, in, in my view, is whether the use at issue threatens the copyright owner with cognizable harm, that is to say, harm of the type the copyright system is intended to prevent. And to try to answer that question then requires some consideration of the underlying purposes of copyright generally, of the right to prepare derivative works in particular, and the fair use doctrine. And again, for time purposes, I won't go into all of this detail here, but there are a variety of possible purposes served by these various doctrines that I think could form the basis for coming up with a definition of cognizable harm. Um, for purposes of my analysis, I define and uh, I, I define the word harm in the following fashion, an unauthorized use harms the copyright owner if the utility of the copyright owner is lower 
in a world in which the unauthorized use occurs than it would be in a world in which the law forbids the user from engaging in the use, absent the owner's authorization, and the user complies with the law. And again, that's just the first step of the analysis. Is there harm as I define it here? So in some instances, there won't be any harm flowing from the unauthorized use, the paradigm example uh, being the high transaction cost case, where high transaction costs alone uh, prevent the parties from negotiating a mutually acceptable license. Uh, but assuming that there is harm, again, as I define it here, then the second, I think, more important question is whether that harm is the type that copyright law should recognize. Is it a harm that copyright law should provide a remedy for or not? So there will be some easy cases in applying this criterion. For example, if I make 100 copies of a bestseller and give them out to friends, my use, my unauthorized use, uh, probably substitutes for at least some authorized sales. And even if it doesn't entirely substitute for authorized sales, again, it seems to me that that's the sort of use that it's hard to imagine copyright law not recognizing the harm suffered by the copyright owner as cognizable harm under those circumstances. Contrast that with a case in which I quote selected portions of the original for purposes of writing a negative book review. So in that case, my unauthorized use harms the copyright owner by diverting demand from the copyrighted work to some other works. But surely that's not the sort of harm that copyright is intended to prevent, precisely the opposite. That's the sort of harm that the copyright system tolerates because it's consistent with the overarching purpose of copyright um, of promoting freedom of expression and debate. And I think that rationale would apply to other forms of critique generally. Um, there are some more difficult cases. What if, for example, my copying whets other people's appetites for authorized copies? On the one hand, that would technically, I think, qualify as harm under my analysis because you can imagine a world in which the unauthorized use um, had to, the, uh, the user had to obtain for permission first, and so in at least some weak sense, the copyright owner is worse off in the amount of whatever licensing fee he or she would have demanded, if any. Um, but whether that should be viewed as a cognizable harm, I think, is a more difficult question. As I read current law, it is a cognizable harm to the copyright owner, but opinions may differ as to whether that actually makes sense. As for harder cases, some of the more interesting recent cases in copyright law, recent over the past decade or so, for example, reproduction of works of visual art for purposes that are ancillary to news reporting or historical commentary, or satires, the famous Dr. Seuss case involving the cat not in the hat, uh, or works that critique the culture that a work has come to symbolize, such as the uh, SunTrust Bank case involving the unauthorized retelling of Gone with the Wind from the standpoint of the slaves. Um, and I think there are a variety of considerations that ought to play into whether or not the harm that the copyright owner may suffer from these unauthorized uses, whether that harm is something that copyright law should recognize as cognizable harm. Uh, for example, and I don't think this is an exhaustive list of considerations, but for example, does the use at issue create a conventional type of derivative work? Is the use of a type that was foreseeable at the time of creation, that's Professor Balganesh's criterion, or that is likely to pose a threat to the copyright incentive scheme, that's Professor Bohannon's consideration. Um, I think that's a relevant factor to take into account. Maybe it should be dispositive on the issue if the use was not uh, foreseeable at the time the work was created or if the use is unlikely to affect incentives. Maybe it should be permissible uh, per se. Uh, I, I do raise a question in the paper though, even if that is a desirable rule as a matter of policy, uh, is it consistent with at least some of the textual provisions of the Copyright Act? But maybe we can take that up during the question and answer period. Um, third criterion, is the use the most effective way for the user to express her viewpoint? I think conventional First Amendment law would say that generally speaking, the government has to have a substantial or sometimes even compelling interest to prevent somebody from expressing their viewpoint in the way that they feel is most effective. That sort of analysis arguably ought to inform more of the copyright debate. Does the use at issue cause psychological, moral rights type harm to the author? 
And, and if it does, should we care? Is that a legitimate consideration, a legitimate value to take into account for copyright purposes? Uh, relatedly, is the author of the original work likely to enter the market niche served by the use, or does the author prefer to prevent anyone from occupying that niche? Uh, and, and then maybe actually another criterion that I talk about in a later portion of the paper, would recognizing um, the harm as cognizable enable the copyright owner to exercise control over some other market or some other technology? And if so, maybe that would be a reason, or at least it's something to take into account in deciding whether or not the harm should be viewed as cognizable. So I think often there's going to be no easy answer to these questions, but I think these are really the underlying policy considerations that ought to inform the analysis. And on this view, transformativeness in terms of content or purpose may be relevant, uh, but really shouldn't be the focus of the inquiry. Uh, I conclude the paper with some applications of this analysis, um, including at the very end a brief discussion of the recent uh, J.D. Salinger case, where Salinger filed suit and succeeded uh, in preventing the publication of an unauthorized sequel to Catcher in the Rye. I argue that uh, the outcome of that case is uh, inconsistent with the underlying purpose of copyright, unless we recognize this moral rights consideration uh, as being deserving of value. And I express some skepticism as to whether it should be. But anyway, I should stop there and uh, let our next speaker come forward. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm up from Tulane this morning. Last time I was here, it was the fall of 2005, shortly after Hurricane Katrina came through New Orleans. Glad to be back at Nashville uh, for just the day today. Uh, talking, uh, I was originally on the third panel and was moved to the first panel. <laughs> Always trouble for me to get up in the morning. But we'll see how I can do. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about derivative works. I'm not sure if I'm going to talk specifically about fair use. My main topic here is the notion of complementary works or complementary uses of copyrighted works and how the Copyright Act should deal with them generally. Um, a few years ago, I went back and got my PhD in economics, and now I seem to approach everything from that perspective. Uh, the only explanation I can offer for going back to school and getting my PhD is, well, you know, you're coming up on age 40 and you got your midlife crisis, so you got your three choices. Mistress, sports car, PhD in economics, so that's it. <laughs> so here I am. So some of this may be a little uh, divorced from the sort of nitty gritty of copyright law, but I'll, help, I'll try and bring it back to that. And I think I'll start a little bit with that as well. Now on a wintry evening in Chicago, in 1903, and I guess when you say a wintry evening, you know it's going to be cold and blustery. Teddy Roosevelt was giving a speech uh, on national policy for the United States, and he said some words that really stuck with him, which is, you should speak softly and carry a big stick. Now, if you're a copyright owner and you want to speak softly and carry a big stick, the stick you pull out of your bundle is not the derivative work right. The derivative work right has proven largely unimportant among the rights that, among the five or six rights, depending on how you count them, that Section 106 of the Copyright Act presently gives a copyright owner. It was originally created, or some version of it, the translation right in 1870 as a direct response to the Stowe v. Thomas case. In that case, Thomas ran a newspaper in a German-speaking portion of Pennsylvania. He serialized and translated Uncle Tom's Cabin in his paper, and Harriet Beecher Stowe sued for copyright infringement. And the court held, this is not a copy. It's a translation, and a translation is not a copy, and at that time, the only right you had under the copyright statute, or the only relevant one, was the right to reproduce the copyrighted work, and so it was not a copy. So in 1870, we get the translation right added to the statute. It's expanded in 1909 to encompass dramatizations, film or play versions of novels, and then we finally get the 76 Act codification of it, where it's expanded to include any work based upon one or more pre-existing works. Now, the language there sounds very broad, but in application, it hasn't proven very broad at all. In fact, most of the work in this area is done by the reproduction right. So in the Nichols case, where uh, Universal makes a movie from a play, it should be dealt with under the derivative work right, but Han announces his levels of abstraction just under the reproduction right. In the Harry Potter case this past summer, 
you would think this is a classic derivative work. I'm making a sort of lexicon, an encyclopedia of the Harry Potter books from the books, clearly a, a sort of change in substance and form over the original works. But the district judge says it's not a derivative work, it's a copy. So it's not really proven that relevant. Yet I think it has an important role. It could play in copyright. And that's the distinction, or help us draw the distinction between a uh, defendant's use that substitutes for the original and a use by a defendant that complements the original. In economic terms, a substitute is something that reduces demand for uh, another product, where a complement increases demand for it. And so there are lots of examples of substitutes and complements, uh, and we'll talk about some of them in just a minute. But the key economic point is we have a really good economic story of why copyright should control the unauthorized production of substitutes. But for the control of copyright, the copying competitor will show up, copy your work, and reproduce it, and sell it for less, and the original author will never make back their creativity costs. We don't really have a very good economic theory about why they should control the production of complements at all. Um, most of the rest of our economy, we do not allow the control, uh, one person to control the production of complements for their product. You create a car, you build a car, other people can offer aftermarket products for it, radios, stereos, tires, what have you. You create a dress, wonderful new fashion design, other people can offer shoes or handbags or other accessories to go with the dress. So the general rule in our economy is that you don't get to control complements, and there are good reasons for that. And so uh, in copyright, we run into this complement issue really in three areas. There are three sorts of complements that we ought to be concerned with. So the first is a sort of hardware-software complementary uh, relationship. And so you got your MP3 player, your iPod, or otherwise you got your VCR, once upon a time. Now you have your DVD player, your Blu-ray player. Uh, all of these things are required to play the content, hardware, software, in the computer industry. You can't have one without the other, or if you have one without the other, it really doesn't do you very much good. And so they're complementary. If you have a better uh, music player, you're more likely to buy more music to go play on it. So that's one type of complementary uh, use we might see. The second type is uses of the copyright owner's own work that are complementary to that work. And the classic example here is radio airplay. I play your song on the radio and voila, people go out and buy it. And pretty well established relationship, so it's a complementary use. I haven't changed your work or modified your work, just playing it on the radio. The third type of complementary use is the one Tom Connor was talking about and the panelists focused on today, uh, where you have Take an existing work and you rework it. And the reworking is complementary in that it increases the demand for the original work in its original form. The classic example here is the film made from a novel. Whenever a film or movie comes out that's based upon a novel, sales of the novel go up. They don't go down. And so that makes it a complement in economic terms, not a substitute. And so what I'd like to do briefly today is talk through three aspects of what it means for something to be a complement. And the first is, what are the economics of complements, just so we have some rudimentary understanding of why we might want to treat them differently than substitutes. The second is a brief look at what copyright law tries to do with complements. In fact, it's all over the map. Sometimes it allows them, sometimes it requires permission, sometimes it doesn't. And then the third question is to see if we could address what the answer should be here. When should a copyright owner's exclusive rights, their control, extend to control over a complement? So going back briefly to the economics of complements, there's a real well-known, very simplistic, kind of absurdly simplistic example which illustrates whether a monopolist in one market needs to control adjacent complementary markets in order to get the profits from those markets as well. The usual economic answer is no, and here's the sort of absurdly simple hypothetical. Let's assume that you have a monopoly over manufacturing a pair of shoes, and you're the only shoe seller out there, and consumers, again these numbers are all just made up for illustration, will pay $10 for a pair of shoes, and it costs you $1 to make each shoe. Now if you have a monopoly over both, the full pair, both sets, left and right, of shoes, you'll charge $10, you'll earn a monopoly profit of 8 what if you only control production of the left shoe? And the market for the right shoe, anyone can enter, and everyone is producing those competitively. 
Well, in a competitive market, we'd expect the price of the right shoe to be priced at $1. It's marginal cost. So consumers can buy their right shoe for $1. Do you earn less money as a monopolist now with that complementary market outside your formal control? No, right? You sell your one left shoe so that everyone can have a pair, and you sell it for $9. Instead of $10 with a cost of two, now you're selling one. $9 with a cost of one, your monopoly profit is exactly the same on each pair of shoes, even though you have no control, no right to control the complementary market, and it's allowed to proceed in a, in a competitive fashion. And while this is a simple or absurdly simple example, it's generally true. You can use a lot more complicated models. Sometimes you don't recover quite as much over the mar complementary markets just by charging more for the market you do control, but often you earn just as much. Uh, and so the control over complements is usually not essential in terms of maximizing or increasing economic incentives. Well, how does copyright law deal with this issue? Well, we can walk through the areas, the three areas we just talked about. With respect to hardware, we have the Sony Safe Harbor. That is, if you manufacture and sell hardware that could be used uh, with various copyrighted works, potentially to infringe them, then so long as your hardware or your machine or whatever it is, the product you're selling is capable of substantial non-infringing use, you're generally going to avoid being held secondarily liable. Now, we do have the Grokster limitation there, inducement, but I would think people are going to be sufficiently well advised and careful to avoid naming themselves uh, Grokster after Napster, so we won't have any future stirs in the P2P area, and we won't have that apply. What about complementary uses? Uh, so generally, you don't have the right to control complementary hardware. Sometimes you do under the Sony standard, but not generally. Complementary uses such as radio airplay. Well, you do have the public performance right, generally, but not always, right? We've got the Section 110.5 home style use exemption as well as the square footage exemption. Um, so we have some exemptions there. In addition, we have other sorts of exemptions. So if you're a record store, I don't know if you guys remember what record stores were, but once upon a time, in a distant land, there were places that actually sell, sold records, and you could go in and listen to the music. Now, that was a public performance, and ordinarily you would need an ASCAP or BMI license or something of that sort, but Section 110 sub 7 provides a, a specific exemption for that type of use, because the point of allowing people to come into the record store and listen to the records is that it increases the sales of those records. They listen to it, and then they buy it. But the courts are not always consistent here, despite 110 sub 7. In another case, a bookstore used sort of pictures of the Green Lantern and Batman on their flyers, and they were selling those comic books, nonetheless held to be an infringing and not a fair use. So not entirely consistent in that area. What about complementary reworkings? Well, here they're all over the map, right? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sheldon versus Universal, uh, Nichols versus Universal Pictures, Nichols wins. A couple years later, district court says, well, here we're dealing with the same facts in Sheldon, essentially the same type of case. The playwright should win again. This time, no. Um, we have a number of cases in this area where the line is very unclear where the courts are going to draw it. We've got the Game Genie on one side in the Gloob case. That's okay. You can make a Game Genie device but you can in Duke Nukem distribute user-created levels of the Duke Nukem game. So uh, some pretty unclear applications of the result here. So sometimes complementary workings are going to be okay and sometimes not. So now we come to the last part, and maybe perhaps the hard part, which is when should a copyright owner's control extend to a complement? And the important point I want you to get across here is really the economics of these uh, different complements are the same. And the considerations that we ought to bring to bear and therefore the rules that we ought to look to should look pretty similar, and yet they don't. And so the first sort of argument we might see for extending copyright owners' control to complements generally is incentives. More money for copyright owners is better. Of course, there are a couple of problems with this. The first problem is that we don't, as we've seen, give copyright owners a complete control over all the complements. Um, and the second problem with this is often the complements need some incentives too. We want new iPods or new MP3 players. We want new technologies to distribute and play music or, or television shows or audiovisual works. Uh, 
We want the e-readers to be developed, whether it's Kindle or someone else's, right? And those require incentives as well, and not only for the technology, but also for reworkings. And it took effort to create the Harry Potter lexicon, and that requires an incentive of its own if we're trying to maximize social welfare. And so then it becomes a question of where at the margins uh, do we want more of? Do we want more of the original works or more of these complementary products? And that's really hard to answer in the abstract. Uh, but at least in a couple of areas, it seems like we're getting the answer a little bit wrong. Take the public performance right for radio stations. Should we essentially transfer a little bit of the monopoly profits radio stations used to earn over to songwriters? And the argument there is, do you want a little bit uh, a few, a little bit more incentive to create radio stations, so more radio stations, or more incentive to write songs, uh, more songwriting? Uh, well, you might say that's hard to answer in the abstract, but if you look to what the parties themselves actually do, the songwriters are paying the radio stations for playing their songs, right? The recurring payola scandals. That says that under the existing set of rights, the radio songwriters are saying, we're getting too much of the money, and we're going to give some of it to you, radio station, so that uh, you can have a larger share of this pie that we're creating jointly. So I don't think we can get very far with an incentive story. So I think we need to look at other considerations. And uh, I try to outline some of those in the paper, but let me come at them indirectly by talking a little bit about the economics. The first consideration I think is key is, are we going to have a natural monopoly? Are we only going to have sort of so many of the complementary works or goods. Take the film example. Films are very high cost to produce, low marginal cost. You would expect that if we get a film uh, version of a novel, they can charge a low enough price on that film to keep the other film versions essentially out of the market. And radio stations historically had the same sort of natural monopoly character. In these uh, situations where you can only have one or sort of a set number of the complementary good, probably makes sense to recognize the copyright owner's right to a share of those monopoly profits. Consumers are not harmed because the net price is not really going to go up. In radio airplay, for example, do we see more commercials because of the ASCAP or BMI license? Probably not, right? The radio station maximizes its revenue sets the number of commercials or hours of commercials it's going to use to maximize that revenue. Now it just has to pay a share over to the copyright owner. And the second concern here, particularly in the film area, is if we're only going to get one, author, one film, whether it's authorized or unauthorized, and whoever's first is the only one we're going to get, at least for a given time period, until the market can reset itself, we probably want the authorized version rather than the unauthorized version. The second sort of concern I would focus on is what are the benefits and risks of allowing or requiring a license? And so one of these is certainly, as Professor Connor alluded to, if there are high transactions costs relative to the gains in trade available, uh, then you probably don't want to require a license because it's simply not worth the energy and time required to negotiate the license given the amount of license fee that's going to be available. But it doesn't seem to me that that's necessarily the only reason. Though it, that reason alone, I think, accounts for a lot of why we don't allow copyright owners to control complementary hardware. If you had to go to every copyright owner in the country and say, can I make an iPod, and if even one or two or three of them said no, you couldn't make it, uh, then that would be a serious problem with creating that particular complementary good. In contrast, making a film from a novel, you only need to go to one, so the transactions costs are not that high. Doesn't mean there's not necessarily a problem in some cases, but generally not. Now, the second problem here, though, is not just transactions cost, but a version of what we call Arrow's Paradox. Uh, Arrow's Paradox is if you have information that's valuable to someone and you want to sell it to them, you go to them and say, I have a great idea and I can make you a lot of money. How much will you pay me for it? And they say, well, what is it? And you say, well, I can't tell you. And they say, well, if you can't tell me, I can't tell you how much I'm going to pay for it. Okay, I'll tell you. Here it is. Well, thanks. I'll just use that. And instantly, I'm not going to pay you for it either. Right? So there's this problem that's called Arrow's Paradox, where if you know the information, you'll be willing to pay for it, but why pay for it? You already have it. If you don't know the information, you don't know how much to pay for it. And I think that's a problem that really plagues the derivative work market. If I have a really creative idea of something I can build off your television show, maybe a Seinfeld aptitude test, the SAT, or something I can build off your sort of photograph of puppies or a couple holding their puppies, so I'm going to make a sculpture of that. 
Do we really want that second artist to have to go and negotiate, disclose their sort of creative idea to the original author and say, will you give me permission to do this? Because there's a real risk that the original author will say, oh, well, that's a great idea, and I'll just do it myself or pay someone else to do it. Um, and so I think there's the Eros paradox. There's also an issue here of creative control. Right? If you're going to give the original author control over the derivative works, the person who has this great second idea may not really get to pursue it. And so I think those are uh, two of the key considerations along with the point Professor Cotter made about whether the incentives are foreseeable, so potentially unforeseeable creative works, uh, not going to be part of your derivative work bundle, hard to know. And then there's this last category, a little fuzzy, called congestion externalities which I'll just say, but then I won't talk about it all because I think I'm pretty much out of time. So I'll turn the panel over, uh, the podium over to Professor Nevay. <laughs> Were we supposed to read this last night? Yes, you <laughs> no, you were supposed to read it while I'm here. All right, let me just uh, let me just make a few changes here. Good morning. Um, I, I'm not supposed to be here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm here because there was a, uh, a speaker from France who was supposed to be here this morning and um, got the flu and was afraid that when he got to Dallas Airport, they would say, go back home uh, because of the flu. So, uh, so the, uh, the students uh, who are uh, responsible for this conference just went around the building and said, let's find a professor with a French sounding name. And so I'm here. Um, the irony is I actually have, I'm working on a paper on derivative works, but it's nowhere near ready. Uh, so what I decided instead is because Professor Geiger, who is supposed to be here, um, was presenting on limitations and exceptions, I remembered that I had this paper that I submitted to a journal. Now, this is to tell the JetLaw people not, what not to do in December of 2007, and uh, I'm told I will get the proofs soon. Um, so, uh, so I put on my best French tie for you this morning, and then I will um, uh, try to present this 61-page paper in um, 15 minutes. Uh, there will be a few shortcuts, obviously, um, and uh, hopefully they're addressed in the paper. So this uh, uh, essay here uh, that I'm presenting uh, comes from a, reali a, a, a realization and, and then a thought experiment. The realization is fairly simple. Uh, at the international level, my paper really is situated at that level. Exceptions and limitations to copyright are essentially unregulated. Uh, and uh, when you think about it, that's a little strange. Um, so the thought experiment was, can we actually take a few steps towards uh, finding some way to regulate, uh, to uh, provide a framework, uh, as it were, for, for limitations and exceptions. So this is what I, I tried to do here. Now, if you look at the history of copyright at the international level, uh, you will quickly notice that it looks like a one-way rights elevator. Um, starting in 1886 with the Berne Convention, which is the by far most important copyright treaty, uh, which the U.S. joined in 1989, not 1889. Um, what you see are a series of revisions to that 1886 instrument. So it was revised six times, the last in 1971. And each time, the purpose was to add new rights. So it started with a very basic text, which provided very basic rights. And then the convention was amended uh, several times in response to technological change. And that's an assumption I will challenge a little later uh, in my presentation. 
let me just give you a couple of quick examples. So copyright started, as the name indicates, copyright, that as the name to make copies essentially of books. And then uh, a couple of categories of authors thought this isn't fair. And these were people who write music and uh, theatrical plays, theater plays. So they basically said, we don't make money because we sell stuff that's reproduced. We do sell some sheet music and we sell some of our plays. But the money's really been being generated when this is publicly performed in front of a live audience. So we want money for that. We want to be in, 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 able to control that. They were given that right. Uh, and then radio was invented. And people said, oh, well, it's the same thing except at a distance. Let's add that right as well. Then the internet was invented, cable, satellite. I mean, let's, uh, skip a few steps. Uh, and in respect of the derivative work, right, uh, it started as a right of translation. Uh, but then it was extended, it was uh, uh, opened up in a way to other forms of transformation of the content. Uh, and probably the broadest derivative work right in the world is in uh, the US Copyright Act. So this is the rights elevator. And then the exceptions. Uh, the negotiators um, uh, who seem to have been informed or, or motivated rather by the belief that more copyright is better, um, uh, at some point had to give some thought to exceptions to these rights. If you look at the history, there are two types of exceptions. There are exceptions that are there as a matter of principle in the Berne Convention. There's really only one and it's the right of a free press to make certain uses of copyrighted material. And if you uh, go back in history to late 19th century, early 20th century Europe, you can see why some people might have had some concerns about uh, the rights of the free press. There's then a series of exceptions that member states are allowed to make uh, to copyright rights. I did say allowed to make. They don't have to make uh, or, or use any of these flexibilities. Uh, and these were, in most cases, in response to one or two obnoxious countries going to these negotiations saying, well, we have this exception in our national law now, and we want to maintain it. So they made allowance for that. They put some provision in there that said, okay, you can keep it. There's actually only one mandatory exception, whether you look at the Berne Convention or the WTO TRIPS agreement. Does anybody know? I'm just curious. The only mandatory exception, the right to quote, quotation right. Um, that's the only mandatory exception. That's how unregulated the field is. And then, in 1967, the Berne Convention negotiators, this was a major revision to this convention, said, well, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to always make uh, exceptions or allow countries to make these exceptions. Let's find some sort of general test to make sure that countries have some uh, room to move. And they came up with uh, something that's quite famous now. It's called the three-step test. Uh, and it's uh, discussed in the paper. But it's essentially not actually that far from the cognizable harm test uh, that we just saw. And that's really kind of a cap that is imposed on exceptions and limitations. Rights, however, are not capped. So there's a, a cap on what countries can exclude from the uh, scope of exclusive rights, but there is no cap on how far they can protect. And as I said, a country would be perfectly burn compliant if it had no exceptions of any kind, gave absolute exclusive rights to control every possible use of a copyrighted work, except the right to quote to, from, uh, from that work. <coughs> The ultimate irony is that that's not what the authors wanted. By the authors here, I mean the people who actually drafted the first text of the Berne Convention. Victor Hugo, the French uh, playwright and novelist, uh, was the head of the association that drafted the, the Berne Convention text, the initial text. And there's a quote uh, in the paper on the first page, which I tried to translate uh, in the footnote, that. Uh, clearly recognizes that they did not want unlimited rights. And in fact, not just the French, who were very much um, uh, responsible for this initial draft, but in other countries, the United Kingdom, the Statute of Anne, which goes back 
1710, it's much older, uh, was an act to promote learning, not an act to protect authors against everything. Uh, the Constitution, as we know, is uh, a very interesting uh, instrument, I think unique in the world, that d not only gives Congress the power to uh, regulate copyright, but gives uh, Congress an indication of what the purpose of copyright actually uh, should be. I'm not aware of any other country that, uh, that does that. And in all those cases, something I will loosely call for now the public interest was the dominant consideration. And in some cases, actually, probably the only uh, relevant consideration. So from that, I suggest that, in theory at least, we could set copyright at an optimal protection level. We could actually determine at which level, again, as a theoretical matter, you could uh, set the level of copyright protection uh, to match the underlying uh, objective, the public interest objective. But when you uh, dig a little deeper, you actually, are, I, think I came to the conclusion that, in fact, we're talking about protection levels, plural, uh, because the, what I call the rights geometry, the way that rights will be configured must depend on the number of factors, and these are not, and this is almost self-evident, depends on the type of work, the type of user, the type of use uh, that is made. In a way, uh, that is codified in the fair use provision, section 107, which has four factors, and the courts typically will weigh each factor differently, but the factors themselves reflect these various levels by mentioning, for example, the nature of the work and the nature of the use. So from that initial suggestion, the question is, can we rationalize? Can we find a way to go to the international level and, and, and find a way to uh, uh, provide a framework <coughs> for exceptions and limitations? So I tried various ways to do this. Um, and it boils down to this. Essentially, there are three things that copyright can do. It can give authors by authors, I mean people who own copyright, uh, which we could, we could discuss that uh, as well uh, as a separate matter. But which functions should be within the author's control? Which functions should an author be able to say, no, you can't? I guess I get the French flu too. Um, which function should the author not be able to control but should be paid uh, compensated for, uh, and we call those compulsory licenses. And it's a form of income, income distribution, uh, I suppose, but uh, interestingly, the United States has the largest number of compulsory licenses in its Copyright Act than, I think, any other country. So it's something that is used quite a bit uh, in uh, the legislative uh, system that was put in place here. And then, obviously, thirdly, which functions should be free? of both control and payment. And perhaps then we need to say, well, when should those functions be free? And again, if you look back at the history internationally, the only consideration or the dominant consideration was public interest, but not just author rights public interest, but obviously something a little broader. And uh, I, in the paper, go to uh, human rights analyses, uh, uh, other norms that are relevant to the public interest. In other words, when you look at copyright exceptions and limitations, you're dealing with two types of uh, equilibrium. Um, one is copyright needs to be internally balanced to achieve its objective, but increasingly because of uh, things like uh, file sharing and, uh, and rights holders trying to find out who you are not that anybody in this room would file share, but you may have heard of people who do it. Uh, you know, who you are trying to catch you. Uh, then there, there's a need to balance copyright against other interests that you may have, like privacy, for example. And obviously not all of this can be dealt with solely by copyright exceptions and limitations, but obviously copyright exceptions and limitations can go a long way to address uh, 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 some of the, uh, the underlying issues. So. If we dig again a little deeper, the public interest, as it was stated, at least originally, and as it's still stated in the Constitution, is to promote learning, the progress of science. On the human rights side, I don't think we can completely avoid um, 
looking at human rights, especially at the international level, uh, we see a, a balance there as well. Uh, human, uh, human rights instruments uh, mention both the protection of the interests of authors, both moral and material, interestingly, uh, but also the rights that we all have to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, uh, something starting to resemble a right of access. And at the international level, there's also increasing recognition of, for each country of something called the right to development and privacy I've, I've, I've uh, mentioned. All these conflicts between copyright and these other rights must be managed somehow. Answers must be found. You cannot get to a situation in law where you have a conflict between privacy and copyright and say, oh, oh no. We're going to go to a court and the court will say, oh, I don't know, I'm not touching that one. Right? The court must find an answer. Somebody must get to yes or no. In addition, human rights have the great advantage, I think, of adding uh, a values-based uh, discussion uh, uh, to, um, to the effort. But perhaps you're going to say, ah, I don't care about human rights. This is about money. Okay, don't talk to, my, to me about access or culture. It's all about money. Okay, let's do that for a while then. Actually, I'll say, you know what? There's a really strong argument to say, just forget about human rights. It's all about money. And that is, The fact that the Berne Convention, which was a standalone copyright instrument, was essentially overtaken, uh, was, was uh, uh, replaced uh, in the minds of many people by another agreement, this one in the trade area, the WTO TRIPS agreement, which basically said, we're going to take the Berne Convention and we're going to bring it to the World Trade Organization and we will enforce it. And there were two panels that had to interpret exceptions to, ex including the 1105 exception uh, that Professor Lenny mentioned uh, in the US Copyright Act, to measure the, those exceptions to determine whether they were compatible with this famous three step test. And the steps of the test are essentially, and I'm summarizing here, but obviously, interference with normal commercial <coughs> exploitation. These are four words that, as lawyers, we love. What's interference? What's normal, right? Wow. What's commercial? And what's exploitation, right? You could see lawyers having fun with that one. And then the step, this, the third step also says that an exception or limitation must not prejudice the author's legitimate interests unreasonably. Another wonderful word. And the two panels that had to interpret national exceptions and see if they were compatible with the test essentially said this is about money. Are rights holders losing money? If they're losing money, then the exception violates the test. Simple, extremely dangerous, but at the same time certainly supports the view that this is now all about money. If we use this and, and accept it as a given in our equation, uh, then you can find a way to use the test uh, to uh, either cabin the right uh, internationally, or perhaps you could even suggest that the three-step test should be the one and only exception in national law, and then let the courts decide. Let's put the steps in, and then whenever you use something, let the courts decide. Kind of fair use on steroids, in a way. You'd have to go to court every five minutes to have, then obviously with time, case law would, would uh, build up. But my sense is putting the three-step test in national law, as some countries have actually done, uh, is a, it's, it's a cop-out. It's basically to say, we're not going to do our work as legislators. Uh, I actually see this three-step test much more as either a guideline or a safety uh, net. So, I mentioned I wanted to challenge one of the assumptions. One this assumption that I, I would challenge is that every time a new technology comes up that allows a new form of use of copyrighted material, the default is exclusive rights. I don't think that's right. I think the case needs to be made. Um, and in some cases, we've given that right, say, take file sharing again. But then the technology says, you want to regulate me? Good luck. Not going to work. Uh, so, you know, peer to peer, you know, they go to court. And yes, they get a judgment against this one defendant, but peer to peer continues, actually is growing. In addition, privacy. Privacy is very, I think, is going to be increasingly important in enforcing copyright. 
For about 300 years, privacy was a very respected partner of copyright. Copyright didn't care what you read. You didn't have to sign a license when you bought a book. You still don't if you buy a real book. If you buy a book for Kindle, read the agreement. Uh, the situation changed, obviously, both because of technology, but because you as the end user now have the option of re-disseminating the content very easily. You can change the content, create a derivative work, uh, or change it in other ways. And this has actually pushed a lot of old rights, like the right to copy, the right to translate, the right to transform, uh, if there is such a right, uh, beyond uh, its existing limits. And all of this without any thought given at the international level to, well, should we make exceptions? Should we make limitations, either mandatory or possible, uh, beyond the three-step test? This is the kind of slide that you don't want to use. It's very small, hard to see. Uh, but there's a, th I'm doing this on purpose. Um, kidding. Um, so I actually looked at various ways that, you know, instead of saying, well, it, it's all about money or it's, you know, these big high-level conflicts of rights, I, I tried to, uh, and again, I'm taking 61 pages down to a few minutes, but to basically saying, is there a way we can categorize exceptions and limitations internationally to make them make sense, I suppose. And this is kind of the table I came up with. Uh, there are five ways I think you could make exceptions. You could make exceptions by the type of user. Are you a consumer? Are you government? Are you an institution, a library? Are you, what kind of use? Are you making consumptive use or a creative transformative use? And again, there's, that's a shortcut. I said there would be a few. By type of country, should developing countries have rights to make certain exceptions that uh, a more industrialized country doesn't have to right to? to use. How about by type of author? We certainly do in this country to say the government's the author, no copyright. Well, um, and then by type of work, should computer software be treated the same way as a novel or as a Hollywood movie, um, et cetera? And I also then tried to match that against the both the, the two types of, uh, of uh, equilibria that I mentioned, uh, the internal one within copyright but also how copyright has to interface with other rights. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to go through in the time I have all of this, but a few examples. So uh, if you're a limited ability user, this is the top, believe it or not, at this point in time internationally, the top topic for discussion in copyright is to make an exception for people who uh, can't see enough to read. And that's controversial. Actually, the U.S. government, the U.S. Copyright Office, has published a notice in the, in the CFR asking for comments, asking whether it actually would be a good idea to let people who can't read access uh, uh, Braille copies or other types of material. Well, there is some internal balance here, in the, obviously, for copyright. If copyright is about learning and the promotion of <coughs> science, I guess internally it must allow some of this. But also, obviously, there's a question of discrimination. If you look at the broader human rights picture, access to, not spelled the right way, but access, those kind of things uh, are obviously going to be important. Uh, if you're a consumer, um, the internal balance of copyright, first of all, copyright has always kind of stayed out of your private sphere as a user. Now it doesn't actually care about your private sphere. It wants to prevent you from doing certain things in your private sphere. Uh, which makes enforcement difficult, but in terms of its internal balance, copyright is being challenged. Externally, this is reinforced by consumer protection norms, uh, privacy, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but what I try to do here is really to come up with uh, a matrix, I guess you could call it, uh, to, to look at what exceptions uh, could possibly address at the international level, leaving aside a very fundamental part piece of that puzzle. Remember I said there were three things. There were three types of rights, essentially. Full control, right to get, to get paid, no control, and no payment. This says these things should fit in either the first or the second category. I am leaving aside entirely for a different discussion whether some of these should be compensated but not subject to full control. Uh, that's a different discussion that, that actually would make this even more complicated. Uh, but to make it as simple as possible, it's really should these things be subject to either payment or control? And um, from that, 
and this is going to be a bit black box for this morning, uh, I came up with a series of potential principles, very dangerous, never do this, but um, I thought I should try. I go back to the initial principle that copyright should not prohibit, again, the word is prohibit, it doesn't say that you know, whether you could be, you need, you need could be compensated or not, whether you should pay, like in some countries, they have a, a levy, they don't call it a tax, a levy uh, that you pay for what you do in your private sphere so that actually copyright leaves you alone, in, in, as, as the quid pro quo. Um, I say that's a good principle. We've had it for 300 years. Let's keep it. I like to know that what I do in my private sphere is, is, is mine. Now, if you're going to step out of your private sphere and send the thing out to your 300, you know, of your best friends, then you've stepped out. That's a different matter. But as long as you stay in your private sphere, they should leave you alone, they being the copyright owners. I also think that copyright rights, based on the principles uh, in the matrix, should not prohibit access, again, the words, keywords prohibit, in countries or by groups of users who have no reasonable means of access. There is no income, and again, this, remember the three-step test. Are you losing money? Well, no. If you're not providing this material to that country, you're not, there's no market. You've decided that? Okay, fine. Then uh, why, why shouldn't students in that particular country not have access to books to, when they go to school? In the same vein, copyright rights should not pre prevent educational uses that cannot be reasonably <laughs> licensed. Now, that's, again, a shortcut because the question is what can be reasonably licensed is itself contentious. But the principle should be that educational uses are different from other uses. This is, copyright is supposed to be about learning and the promotion of progress in science. Copyright should not prohibit access by institutions whose purpose is to document and preserve cultural assets. Typically here we're thinking of libraries and archives, but um, what is the greatest repository, the greatest archive in the history of, uh, of music? Does anybody know? By far the greatest archive in the entire history of music. File sharing. <laughs> file sharing. There is more stuff on file sharing networks than has ever been stored anywhere before. So the question is, should we take that into account when we try to shut them down? Um, copyright rights uh, should not prevent uses and reuses that serve the public interest in free expression, including the creation and dissemination of culture and information. Again, the key word is prevent. And I've given examples here, parody, uh, pastiche, transformative uses, which I've kind of, again, this is a bit of a shortcut for this morning. Uh, research, criticism, and review. Last four principles. Courts should have latitude not to apply exclusive rights, especially when they interfere unreasonably with the right of information or the rights of a free press. That would solve so many problems. Instead of having these triggers for statutory damages or injunctions, um, that issue essentially automatically when a certain set of facts is uh, brought to the court's attention, I think it would perhaps be a good idea to have courts function as uh, human institutions instead of machines here and uh, have a little bit of more, more latitude. Copyright rights should not prevent governmental use in the public interest. Now, if a government, then some governments do, uh, actually make commercial uses of certain types of material, well, then they've stepped out of their governmental uh, role, perhaps, and then maybe they need to be subject to exclusive rights. Copyright rights should not prevent access uh, and at least non-commercial use of governmental publications of a general nature. Now, for Americans, this is kind of, okay, move on, we know. Well, this is the only country that's like this, right? In every other country, government works are protected the same way as commercial works. Uh, in, uh, for example, in countries like the UK, Canada, Australia, there's something called crown copyright. You have to ask Her Majesty if you want to use some governmental publications. Yeah, um, and uh, that's a little, you know, think about it. You have to go to, you go to a government website in Australia or, or in, in Britain, and you can't make a copy without permission uh, of what's on that website. And finally, uh, because the three-step test is unavoidable, uh, then I say, okay, let's 
have these principles for exceptions, and let's put as a filter, but not as the norm, not, as, not for its normative uh, 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 profile, but really because of uh, the fact that this has become an unavoidable principle. Uh, let's put the three-step test so that we have the, the principle for exceptions, and then we'll filter them through the three-step test, which will do one of two things. It will either say fine, um, we'll, we'll let this exception uh, stand, or as the panels have said at the WTO, there are cases where we need to move from free to compensated, but not full control. And that's uh, unfortunately or fortunately has become an unavoidable part uh, of the picture. And that's it. Thank you very much. I think we have about 25 minutes for questions. Um, thank you all for that presentation. And I'm going to open it up to general questions in just a minute. But first, I wanted to ask you a question that I had while listening to your presentations. Um, now, Professor Lunny said, we heard him say that the derivative use right has been largely unimportant. And indeed, uh, Professor Nimmer, in his famous treatise, has called it completely superfluous. Um, and we just heard Professor Gervais say that we can set an optimum level of, of copyright rights. So I want to step back from it and say, ask, what is the optimal level for the derivative use right? Is it captured, is what the conduct we want to protect captured sufficiently by the reproductive right, the right of reproduction, cabined sufficiently by fair use? Do we need the derivative use right? What order do you want us to do? Mm -hmm. All right, Professor Cotter. Well, I think under U.S. law, there are some discrete situations in which the exclusive right to prepare derivative works adds something that is not covered by the reproduction right. Uh, I think these situations tend to be at the margin. So, for example, uh, think of the, the Gilliam uh, versus uh, American Broadcasting Companies. So, taking the original and modifying it might, under some circumstances, amount to the unauthorized preparation of a derivative work, but it wouldn't, for technical reasons, it wouldn't be a reproduction because you're not copying the original work, you're using the original and modifying it. Um, so, you know, there are a few instances where that situation arises. There are a few odd provisions of the Copyright Act where a compulsory license uh, may be uh, applicable if the work at issue is a derivative work as opposed to a mere reproduction. So at the margins, there are a few differences, but they tend to be fairly marginal sorts of things. And if copyright law were, you know, if the reproduction right were altered in some way, it could capture these few marginal instances within the rubric of reproduction. So at least as I view the law today, the right to prepare derivative works adds a little bit of something to the mix in certain cases, not very much. Is it necessary as a matter of policy? I think that depends on how much weight we give to some of these justifications for the right to prepare derivative works. I think it adds relatively little in terms of incentive to create the underlying work, whether or not we should give weight to things like congestion externalities or authors' interests in moral right, I think is a debatable issue, but I think those would be the, the main reasons why we might want to give a derivative work right in some instances. So when you think, say things like optimal copyright, it always pushes a lot of buttons for me. Um, because my view of optimal copyright is probably a, a five-year ban on exact reproduction for commercial purposes and nothing more. And I think if you had that, you would have as much copyright as you needed and wouldn't have the excess we have today. So in my view, you probably don't need the derivative work right at all. Uh, and when I say that, I, I mean that not only in terms of the derivative work right in 106.2, but I wouldn't even extend the reproduction right in most cases to works that are not competing with the original in its original format. So I would take the reproduction right and use the uh, audience response test we see in, in some of the cases. But I would ask the audience, do you see this as the same work and you would accept it in the stead of the original work? And if not, if so, it's an infringement. If not, it's not. And that would be the end of the inquiry. Um, uh, there may be a few instances where it, 
you could make an argument for a slightly broader right, particularly under moral rights, which is one of my favorite oxymorons. Um, but I would basically do away with it and radically narrow copyright, but that's just me. Professor um, I, it, it's, it's obviously it's a matter of definition. I, um, what I suggested is that within the current rights framework that we have internationally, which is not going to go away anytime soon, there is a way to optimize that l level by having a, a principal discussion on what limitations and exceptions should be, which we've never had. As I said, it's a big deal right now. It's a big deal for a lot, a lot of the copyright negotiators that there, there's actually a debate about whether we should have some exceptions to allow people who can't read uh, to have access to a different kind, a different version of certain works. Uh, so optimal defining that uh, is is perhaps suboptimal if you were to say, well, let's start from scratch. But obviously, we're not there. What, the point is, I think though that the rights elevator has stopped. We're not going up. Uh, I don't think we're going to go up very uh, in internationally uh, anytime soon. Uh, not just developing countries, but a lot of more industrialized countries are saying, wait a minute, okay, we keep giving rights and it doesn't seem to be doing that much. Uh, and so a lot of countries, the Europeans in particular, are saying, you know, they've actually given a few more recently. They've extended the term of, of copyright protection on sound recordings, for example. Uh, but they knew that it made no sense in a way that's kind of an interesting way to make policy. Uh, <laughs> If you look at the history of copyright, uh, that's when I said optimal models or, or uh, uh, protection levels, uh, for example, the UK had five-year protection for photographs until it joined Bern and then was stuck with the Bern minimum protection. But uh, a lot of countries had that. I mean, there is something intuitively right about that. The question is, how do you go from that intuition into something that uh, looks more like a model, which Professor Lenny can do a lot better than I do? I can. Uh, now, the last thing I'll say is if you look at the uh, original fair use cases, uh, and this is going, the point here is going to be that there's a kind of a cycle here, uh, that uh, whether you look back to Folsom versus Marsh or the uh, Nation case about President Ford's uh, memoir and so on, uh, the courts are looking for that substitution, and really they're doing what the three-step test does, which is Who's losing money? Are you losing sales? Are you going to lose sales because of this use? Uh, and that is very much what the two panels did in the, uh, in the two WTO cases. They said, okay, show me economic harm. Uh, that's not what copyright was about. Copyright, especially if you look at it as a property right, if somebody trespasses on your land, you don't have to go to court and say, oh, I have evidence of actual harm here, right? You can actually throw the person out. Well, with copyright, certainly having moved to the trade realm, uh, now the panels are saying, no, that's not the way it works here. This is the World Trade Organization. Trade's about money, essentially. And show us that you've lost money, and then we'll maybe decide that the exception's not acceptable. Great, thank you. Professor Madison? So I have a question for Colin. Uh, so as uh, Professor Gervais just pointed out, there is sort of this emerging dialogue in copyright about whether there should be a recognized concept of harm at all. Yeah, well, the way I define harm in the paper, and again, it, it's, in a sense, it, it, it's ancillary to the overall question of whether certain types of harm should be compensable. So I try to come up with, all right, I, I start with the framework, would the copyright owner be better off or worse off in some alternative universe in which the use at issue, um, you know, so we have two alternative universes, one in which the use at issue is, uh, 
uh, can go forward without any authorization and one in which the copyright owner's consent would be necessary as a condition to the use fee going forward. So looking, just focusing on those two possible states of the world, is the copyright owner worse off in one as opposed to the other? And if the answer is yes, then there is harm as I define it, but then the next question is whether we should care about that and is that something that we care about? So I guess implicit in that is some causation element, I guess that would be necessary, wouldn't it? Because, well, so, so in a case in which transaction costs would prevent the parties from bargaining, then there is no harm, there's no causation, right? There's nothing the defendant is doing that is causing the plaintiff to be any worse off in one state of the world as opposed to the other. So I guess causation is implicit in there. Yes? So then the follow-up question is, well, do you think it's important to make the causation explicit and then sort of tease out the Well, maybe so. Maybe I need to focus more on causation. I mean, I kind of allude to that in the, the, easy, the first of the easy hypotheticals, where I make 100 copies of a bestseller. Okay. All right. Had I not done that, would I have bought 100 copies? Maybe not. Maybe I would have bought 20 copies, and 80 of them just, you know, would have been foregone. Um, so should, is the copy, has the copyright owner suffered any sort of harm by virtue of losing sales of the 80 that I wouldn't have bought anyway? And I th answer that question by saying we should still recognize that as harm because if we don't, the implication would be that the copyright owner would have to actually prove uh, that my unauthorized use cost him or her a sale. And I think that would raise all sorts of administrative difficulties. So I guess in that sense, I'm moving beyond strict causation to some sort of constructive harm. And maybe I do need to make that more explicit. Professor Hatcher? Well, I, what I'm trying to do, though, is to avoid the circularity. I mean, I think I agree with you. I mean, the ultimate question is, is, is the copyright, do, should we recognize that the copyright owner has a right to prevent or demand compensation for the use at issue? I mean, that, I think that's essentially what I am trying to get at. It is that normative question. So I'm going at it by trying to define something as harm, but I guess maybe it could be rephrased in some way, but I think we're on the same page, yes. I think I'm trying to ultimately answer the question of whether society should compensate or prevent the use. I mean, does the copyright owner have a recognized interest here that society should, uh, should give weight to? I think we have a question in the back up here. You mentioned Salinger. Do you mm -hmm. read Salinger to, to hold that uh, the actual copyright owner's intent to enter the market occupied by the allegedly, allegedly infringing work is irrelevant? I think that is where Judge Batts ultimately comes out on that. I mean, she does hold out the possibility, well, maybe Salinger, or I guess when he dies, his heirs may change their mind and authorize a sequel, or maybe an author. But she also gives some weight to the possibility that an author might have been motivated to create the work initially uh, in recognition of the possibility that nobody would ever create an authorized, an unauthorized sequel. I think that's not very likely at all. But uh, anyway, but I think, you know, given that, it seems to me that she does seem to give weight to the author's right to veto uh, any sequel. And uh, I question whether that is consistent with copyright if we view copyright as being a vehicle for promoting expression as opposed to inhibiting it. Well, what does that 
the harm would be psychological harm in that case. So I mean, in, in the paper, I, I, I don't limit the harm as I, again, as I define it for my purposes. I don't limit it to economic harm, but also psychological or moral rights type harm, which I think is the harm that Salinger would be concerned about. Yeah, Professor Tushman. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I actually, I, I don't see it that way. In fact, in my copy of Glenn's paper, I it's write... It's not a paper. It's just sort of a little five-page, here's some preliminary oh, thoughts. In, in my copy of your five-page preliminary thoughts, I write, this is consistent with my five factors. I think we're actually moving in the same direction, albeit, again, I'm using this particular framework to approach this issue. But it seems to me that the, the factors that I list as being relevant to whether the harm is cognizable are actually match up fairly closely, I think, with the four factors you come up with in determining whether or not the copyright owner should be able to control certain complementary uses. Um, they're phrased somewhat differently, but it seems to me that they're actually fairly consistent with, at least that's the way I read it. Well, I certainly think there are consistencies in our analysis, though my starting point, I would say, is a lot different from where you are in cognizable harm, focusing on the author's utility. I would focus on uh, social utility, I guess I am straightforward utilitarian, and so I, I don't want to know if the author's better off. I want to know if we're going to get more works out of it, that those works are going to be valuable to society. Are they more valuable than the alter alternative uses to which those resources would otherwise be put? So for me, it's always a question of whether society would be better off or worse off by giving the right to the author in a particular case. Yeah, but I, I don't disagree with that. I think my ultimate focus is social utility. I ask the initial question of whether the author has suffered a loss of utility, but then the, 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 the more important question is, do we care? Is there any social utility in recognizing the author's loss of utility as compensation? You want to provoke us a little bit, Rebecca? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean maybe I misread it, but I, I read uh, your, your paper uh, to actually say that the concept of complementary use is incoherent and, in fact, just oh, I see. varies the questions, whereas all right, I, I do think there's some disagreement there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, first of all, I think it seems to me that a lot of conventional derivative works are complementary, but not all of them. And I'm not sure if you're saying that all derivative works necessarily are complementary. If that is what you're saying, I guess I would disagree with that. And even in your movie example, it seems to me that for some people, the movie version of the book is a complement to the original. But for others, it might be a substitute as well. I don't know, I mean, yeah. I like The Godfather of the movie, but I've never been motivated to read the book. Well, I'm not saying that the derivative work category matches directly onto the complement substitute line. I mean, and there may be instances where a given product has both complementary and substitutionary aspects, and you would need to look at those. So keep you file sharing. In some respects, it might well be a complement, and it increases the value of music generally because now there's a very convenient way to store it and distribute it rapidly. At the same time, it may also have some substitutionary effects and that people will get a free copy instead of pay for one. So I'm not saying that it's uh, the complement substitute line maps directly onto the derivative work line, uh, that every derivative work is on one side or the other. I'm just saying that we ought to look at the complement substitute line. And the thing I find troubling in the law is often you'll get uh, Posner or some other judge trying to look at it and saying under the fourth fair use factor, well, this use increases the value of the plaintiff's work. Nonetheless, it's still unfair because um, Congress has given control over some complements to the copyright owners, such as movies. So that means effectively that they've given control over all complements to the copyright owner. And I find that reasoning very troubling. Uh, Professor McKenna, I think you've been waiting. So I'm going to uh, 
question is, do we want people to have control over markets, right, that are ancillary uh, at, at sort of a, a broad level? And I think there's sort of the tension, I think, between the two of you, at least the way I hear it is, uh, Tom, you're inviting courts to make a really fine-grained analysis about harm to this particular plaintiff in this particular case, depending on the consequences of this use on this party, where I think where, where Glenn's going is to sort of say, look, we can make more categorical judgments. Right? We can make judgments about which kinds of uses that we're just not going to care about whether it has, you can tell a story in, in harm terms, because it's just a category of uses that are out. And I think that's the risk of sort of going down the, the road of talking about harm is that it sort of focuses on this particular party in a way that I think ultimately doesn't leave a lot of room for cabinet, right? Unless you just sort of say explicitly, Every use can be told, you can tell a story about harm, because I can say, yeah, it might be true that this increases the value of my work in the original market, but it doesn't increase it as much as if I could both get licensing from this and the benefit in the original market, right? So that's a harm. Right. So it's a harm, but then the second important step is, is, is that a harm that the copyright system should well, why compensate? Just, well, why ask that question first? Why not just well, it will, first of all, it will screen out at least some things, right? So in the high transaction cost case, maybe there is literally no harm because in the world in which the copyright owner um, it, it would not have veto power, no, no deal would be done in the world in which the copyright owner would have veto power, there'd be no, I mean, it, but, it, but it, there's a small number of cases in which there's no harm. The market and the transactions will go down. Well, you'll develop the market maybe, or maybe in some future state of the world, a market would develop to cover this, maybe, maybe not. I mean, the CCC uh, will now clear just about anything for educational use. Uh, I, again, I think some uses would be screened out at step one, but also I think it's useful to, even in step one to clarify what is the nature of the harm that the copyright owner might be complaining about. And then, once we get a grasp on what that harm is, again, harm is I'm defining it, do we care about it? Is it something that we want to compensate the person for, or is it something that we don't want to compensate them for? So, I mean, the first step is relatively trivial in comparison to the second step, I think the all, the bulk of the analysis has to come in regard to the second step. But I think once we approach it in this way and come up with a way of thinking about should this harm be compensable or not, that would then I think ultimately would allow us to make some categorical judgments as to whether certain things that the copyright owner might wish to be compensated for should be compensated or not. I think we ultimately could come to some categorical judgments based on this type of analysis. Yeah, Professor Graham. Um, just a lot of things. 
I, I think in that latter situation, though, I'd still distinguish. I mean, there's a harm in the sense that you don't get the licensing fee. I still, I would still characterize it more as a cognizable harm issue. Do we care that you didn't get the licensing fee if, on balance, you were better off because sales increase? Yeah, and then that piece, I mean, it may be probably a difference, a, a, a distinction without a difference, maybe, in the Just a quick comment. I, I did mean real property in my example, but um, there's so many questions what you just said, and I, there are other people uh, uh, who are working on this. Um, I think Professor Ash in particular, but you know the in interface between tort and and copyright and the strict liability issue. I mean, you could this opens up so many doors. But at the international level, to treat copyright as property. Uh, now, what is the it's, it's, People say in uh, in Europe, for example, they don't say copyright, they say author's rights, which is true, except that for all the countries in the south of Europe, starting with France all the way down to Italy and Spain and Portugal, they actually call it literary and artistic property, right? So there's that attachment to property because, specifically because the remedies are not tied to showing of harm in those legal systems. Now, my approach on the principles of, of uh, for exceptions and limitations just shows that calling it property really doesn't take us anywhere. We have to just leave that uh, kind of thinking aside and, and look at uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know, per use and per user type of distinction that we much more frequently draw. Well, I think we're going to have to stop it there. Um, but I want to thank all of our panelists for their contributions, especially Professor Gervais, who filled in at the last minute. Um, and we'll reconvene at 1045 for our digital object. Panel.